let's move on. I'll tell you a little bit. You always want to start off with compressive members. If you look at the chart, it's, that's the easiest place to tell. You can tell just by looking which ones are compressive and which ones are tension members. It's not always easy to do that by inspection with a real truss, but this chart helps us do this. I call those, those numbers underneath those two columns the tension force slash strength and the compression force slash strength. I call those performance ratios because that's, they show me the performance of the structure. It's uh, the, the kids that I deal with, they're all real, you know, they're math whizzes and they're, uh, they're physics experts and they understand what a ratio is. They know that that is the actual force on those members divided by the strength of those members. So intuitively, and I always ask them this, intuitively, what should that number be for you to have the best, most efficient design? Should be one. Well, one sometimes fails in the software, so to be actually perfect, it should be 0.99. I always tell them, okay, now it's not going to be possible for you to get every member to 0.99, or theoretically it's not possible. Anyway, Jennifer, if you'll click on the compressive force side at the top and sort those in, in ascending order. She just did that. You can, you can sort them in descending order. So real quickly, I can look at the tension side and drop down to where the last 0, 0.00 is, right there. No, it's member 19. Click right there. That'll select that member, and it also selects it over here. You can also select the member right on the CAD format as well. Every member from there up is a pure ten compression member, and we know what compression is. Compression members tend to do what? Tend to shorten. That's right. So what would be a good example of a compression member? How about uh, chair leg? Right? Chair leg would be a good compression member. So intuitively, we could look at a chair leg and we could see that if we had a chair leg that was short and pretty good, pretty good size around, that would be a fairly efficient column or compression member, right? If we had a long chair leg that was really skinny, that wouldn't be quite as, quite as good. It would tend to buckle, wouldn't it? Because that member wants to compress and shorten anyway, right? So it's very important when you're building a bridge, you want your compression members to be as short as possible. Hey, there's the first tip of the day. Short compression members. Conversely, if we were talking about tension members, tension members, what would be a good tension member? What do they tend to do? Tension member tends to pull apart, right? It tends to lengthen. So a good tension member might be a rope, right? So if I had a, a rope, with a 100 pound capacity and it was 20 foot long and asked you to hold one in and we pulled on this, had a 100 pound capacity and we put 101 pounds on it. I think I could hold that. I got bad knees, but I think I could hold that. That rope would fail. But anywhere, all the way up to 100 pounds would be good. What if we had the same rope, same, same internal properties, and it had a 100 pound capacity and we stretched it out to 25 feet? be exactly the same, right? Exactly the same, because the length of the tension members has no bearing on their strength. The tension member won't buckle in that manner. So, if we're designing, we can use our imagination, we can use our, our skill to make all the compression members as short as possible and make up the difference and make sure our tension members are the long ones. Most trusses, you know, trusses are very efficient. So usually they'll have two sides in compression, one in tension or vice versa. At this point, we're going to go ahead and we'll start optimizing our design. We're optimizing our design by looking at the compression force, the compression members. Jennifer, pick one. Pick number 16. It's at the top. And jump up to the top where, the, where it shows the size of the member. There's two ways to, re to reduce the size. Obviously, that's what we want to do. We have a performance ratio of 0.31. It means we have a member that's much larger, much stronger than we need it to be. By reducing the cross-sectional area of that member, we can get more closer to efficiency, right? It makes perfect sense, right? We're looking at the section modulus of our member, the cross-sectional area. So, Jennifer, take that's 140. Let's drop that down. Uh, let's drop down to 90. There's two ways she can do that. She can choose the 90 right off the pull down, 
Or she can use those two little blocks. That one will lower it, and that one makes it bigger. And we're at 90, and run the load test again. This happens a lot when you, when you go through an uh, iterative design process. We've tried to size our member, and we've had a failure. We've had a failure in compression. So we get to go back to, uh, I've always liked to say this, we're going back to the drawing board. This is the only, only occupation in the world where you go back to the drawing board, and it's not a cliche. You actually mean it. We're going back to the drawing board. So we have a failure in our member. We're at 1.35, and that's obviously not what we're looking for. So Jennifer will take and size that back up to 110 and run the load test again. And we're good there. Should we check it? Should we check 100? Why not? And I think we're good. If you'll look, we're also keeping track of the cost. Just by making that one member more efficient, we've saved $1,000. Can everybody see that? You can also drop over to the left. You see where it says iterations, and we talked about those, but there's two little arrows there. If you pull that pull down, down, it actually shows you our progress in going to. So we could, if we wanted, we decided, nah, we're not going to do this. We're going to do something else. We could go back to anywhere in that and choose. One of those, hit OK, and we'd go right back to where we started. So when you're up at 2.30 in the morning, you've got 15 designs going on, and you thought, ooh, I didn't want to do that. I've then made them all this, and I didn't want to do that. You can just jump right in there, click on it, and go right back, and you're back to the drawing board starting over. Jennifer, go ahead and pick the next one. That's member 29. That's a top cord member. I'm going to go ahead and see if you can find a proper size for it. Good place to go would be there. Back to the drawing board. Let's check that number of 0.91. So we have two members now, one at 0.95, one at 0.91. That's pretty good. In the interest of, interest of time, we could, we could sit here and go through each and every one of them. We can also do a lot of them at once. Jennifer, go down to member 19. Click there, and then go up to member 30. And hit the shift button and select them all. You see, I selected them all. So now, Jennifer, you can size all of these at the same time. So you could actually take these down to 80 millimeters by 80 millimeters. And as you can see, we are going to have a failure. So back to the drawing board. You can see every member we chose, we chose the wrong size. So Jennifer, make make the appropriate adjustment by sizing the member up. Now we only have one member that's failing in compression. We know it's failing in compression because it showed red on the screen. If it failed in tension, it'd show blue. And it's also one of our tension members. So now you'll choose that one member and size it up. And look at the, look at the gains that we've made in the, in the cost so far, just by sizing a few members. Now, once again, in the interest of time, what we're going to do is we're going to use our imagination a little bit. Let's assume that we have went through all of those compression members and that we have them all in the high 80s and low 90s, or mid 90s. Everyone is in point, 0.85 to point. So bear with me. Let's pretend that we have accomplished that. 